Hey, what's going on, YouTube? Thanks so much for tuning in. We got another uh, exciting episode planned for you. But before we get into that, be sure to do all that YouTube stuff that we like to ask you to do. Be sure to subscribe, like, turn your notifications. And again, remember to comment uh, below as the YouTube audience likes to do. We definitely uh, pride ourselves on answering your questions and building future content based on your needs and wants and desires. But uh, excited today, Mr. Justin Harris, my co-host, is with us. So thank you, Justin, for joining us tonight. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And uh, Greg, P Greg Pazinski, did I, did I get it right? My first yes. try. Awesome. I nailed it. So <laughs> Iowa State strength and conditioning coach. Uh, yes, so sir. A wealth of knowledge. We're, we're super excited to bring him to you guys today because, again, um, you know, to kind of really get that inside look at someone who professionally does this, has done it their whole life designing programs, developing freak athletes, you know, it's just a, a really cool thing. So I appreciate you joining us tonight. Yeah, I appreciate you guys working with me. I know my schedule is kind of kind of hectic right now, but uh, very excited, very uh, big honor to be with uh, the two of you. So good deal. So I think it'd be nice for our listeners out there just to walk through first, you know, uh, it's always as cool to hear the journey. Uh, we all kind of have our unique story, like what got you into you know, weight training. And then obviously this is, you know, this is your full life of what you're doing. So kind of, how did you, how did your introduction introduce to the iron game and, and all that fun stuff? Uh, for me. So I, uh, I, I came from a broken home, so not very confident growing up, um, found football, uh, was like my first big, like had a real tight group of friends, got into that. And then, um, I had a, uh, I always say this wrong, a slipped epiphysy epiphageal so my left femur came out of the socket when i was in seventh grade hmm. so couldn't play football anymore and got a, a titanium rod in my left hip um got cleared to start lifting though i couldn't do any contact collision but i could lift so my varsity coach had played uh football at canisius college back in buffalo new york um and he had the lifting program going he power lifted in college as well so me and my uh, best friend Josh got into powerlifting, um, and it just was like fascinating to me. Yeah. So back then, I mean, it was all, it was still like powerlifting mags and and you know the USAPL and all those type of things, like yeah. stuff that you don't see these kids get kind of exposure to now. Like I remember, uh, I remember going, uh, going to GNC because the Power of the USA. You'd, You'd hope it would come out every month, but it wouldn't. You wouldn't know what month it would come out. Sometimes you get two months in a row. Sometimes you go three months with nothing. I remember going every time we go to the mall. I'd make my mom let me go to the GNC, and I, you know, scour for powerlift in USA. But well, and uh, uh, well, that's bringing up GNC brings back memories because I remember uh, it was. Uh, oh, I'm gonna get the company wrong, but it was uh, it was a big five gallon bucket of powder. And I remember, I think it was just a, uh, an advanced creatine, if you will. But I remember buying that, didn't tell my mom, brought it home, hit the room. And she's like, what are you mixing in that cup? Let me see that. Did you get this checked by anybody? What's in the label? Yada, yada, yada. All that stuff. But because uh, we used to drink it before we, we had this, uh, we had a, a legit old school, like holes in the wall, um, pit bull gym back in uh, West Seneca, New York. And that's where we would train outside of football. So, but like, I'm talking like, there was a, a section that like you, you only went in there if you knew how to use a monolift, like only the big dogs were allowed back there. Like, um, but fascinating at the time watching these behemoths move this weight. So I got into powerlifting um, and then got clear to play football, went to college, played in college. Um, and then when I realized that you could be a strength coach, when I got done playing, I started um, coaching football and doing the weight room. Uh, at St. John Fisher, where I played, um, coached D-line at Utica College and did the weight room, went interned at Eastern Michigan, and then climbed the ladder there from intern to GA to assistant to associate head. Who was the um, head coach when you were at Eastern? I'm just curious. Ron, Ron English. Ron English, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. I was looking at your yeah. bio, yeah. yeah. He, oh, he, what was he, he like? Was awesome. He was yeah. awesome to work yeah. for. I mean, you're talking a guy that, you know, had an unbelievable run at Michigan, um, yeah. had a stout defense at Louisville. Was he a defensive um, coordinator at Michigan when he was there? Or? Yep. Yeah. If I remember correctly, because this is going back, right. he was one of the, uh, I think he was only one of a handful of people that became like an honorary Michigan man. Because oh, Michigan's yeah. got that whole like, you know, oh, yeah. 
you know, I lived here in Michigan. They do all yeah, the big yeah. stuff. Um, so, but he was a blast to work for. I mean, he, uh, he took care of us. I mean, we were all young. I was, I think I was 26 at the time. Um, the first, my first head strength coach there, um, left after the first fall in her English, he went and took a job at Cincinnati. So, um, a guy named Adam, Adam fight came in. He was like 23. He was younger than I was. And then his assistant came in Blair, who was 24. So like, you're talking three dudes that are all within three years of each other. So like you're young, you've got the world by the cojones because all you do is lift weights. You train people all day. You know, we were making when I was full-time, I mean, I'm, I remember my first full-time salary was like 32,000 and I thought I was loaded. Yeah. Like I could go out to high V or uh, not high V that's out here. Um, Kroger. I remember going to Kroger the first time I got my first full-time paycheck and I didn't have to worry about what I put in the grocery cart. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I name I, brand whatever stuff. I want. Yeah, yeah. Like it wasn't all that stuff. So, um, was there for four and a half years. Um, then went to Illinois as an assistant um was there for eight months and then i had an opportunity to go back to buffalo as the head strength coach for ub um started off under coach quinn um they had a transition and then uh worked for lance lightpole who's now the head football coach at kansas um was with him for a year and then came out to iowa state in january of 16 and uh finishing up my seventh year right now okay so but uh that's kind of the I can't get anywhere warm. It's like, no matter what I did, I, I just couldn't get anywhere oh, warm. I was in the North. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's the only bitter part of it. I guess I would say if I had for my journey, but, uh, um, you know, when I got out here, I met my wife in 17. Um, she wouldn't date me at first. She made me chase her for almost a year. Um, but we just had our first, uh, son, uh, four, three, 21. And then we actually oh, have a second congrats. one on the way in February. So nice. Oh, awesome. Yeah, Congratulations. So, yeah. So that's a, just a personal, a personal accomplishment out here. And I go. special. So what I think what's really cool is like, not only obviously, you, you know, you trained yourself, you, you know, uh, powerlifting and things you mentioned, um, you went through like the formal education with schooling. And then now you're working with all these professionals that are doing this, you know, across, uh, college football landscape and then you also are we're working with justin as a coach for nutrition mm -hmm. overall can you talk a little bit about just your you know your uh hunger for knowledge and just what led you to working with justin and how's that how what, what are some of your kind of goals you have for yourself right now i think what's uh what's really unique about the college landscape right now is um you almost spend the least amount of time as a strength coach mm -hmm. um you have to be able to now it depends on what school you're at and um the resources like do they have a full-fledged nutrition, nutrition staff and rds working with the athletes like when i was at eastern like there's no rds that yeah. you, you were the rd you were the psychologist you were the sociologist you know what i mean so every situation is unique to its own but um i think the thing that uh i loved about working with justin which is why i keep trying to continue to work with him is <clears throat> my formal education so when i was an undergrad i was political science pre-law history and then i had like seven minors um and i had nothing with exercise physiology so when i went to ga my first master's was in sports management and then i got through that that allowed me to sit for the certs i needed at the collegiate level um but i wanted to be i wanted to have a degree in the field because i felt yeah. like at some point that would like bring into question whether or not i knew whether or not I was capable to handle the discipline. So um, I weaseled my way into the exercise phys uh, master's program. So the guy wanted me to take like nine prereqs at the undergraduate level. And at that time I was already full time. So I couldn't, I'm like, I'm, I'm coaching kids. Like I, I literally can't take these classes. Right. So we made a deal that if he put me in the two master's classes offered in the fall of his choice, if I got a 4-0, he'd let me into the program officially. So he put me in like advanced exercise phys one with him. And then he put me in advanced biomechanics with a guy out of Stanford because everything was online. Mm. So I used to go to, I'd get done like around 5.30. I'd go to Starbucks and I'd study advanced X phys for like two hours. I'd go over to Noodles & Co. I'd call the guy from Stanford. He'd give me all the supplemental reading because in biomechanics, we had a test every Friday. Mm. So he knew I was like way out of my league. 
So he would give me like a couple videos, a couple excerpts of books, and then like extra math things to study just to prep for every test every Friday. So like that was my routine Monday through Thursday. I'd get home probably around 1230 and then I'd be back up at five to get back into work because we'd have lifts at six. Yeah. So like that was my whole semester, but was fortunate enough to accomplish the goal and got into the program and then graduated with that master. So, um, but I think if, really quick, Greg, like where, how old were you at that point in life? 23, 24. I, I just think it's important for like, you know, our audience out there, you know, you can obviously do it at any age. I mean, I went back to school in my mid thirties, but I just think, you know, I remember that, uh, several grinds that I've went through, but I think, you know, just yours, like you just said, I mean, Justin shared on other episodes we've had about some of his grinds to get to where he's at, but I think it's important for people to, you know, really just double check, uh, check in on those excuses or those obstacles and say, all right, like, is there, is there really enough time? Cause you know, as you just mentioned, you're going from, you know, 5 AM till nine ten at night, but you made it happen. And now you're, mm-hmm. you know, living your dream in a, you know, in a, a division one, uh, you know, college program. So, you know what, like the, the, what's weird about those things is you can't do stuff like that forever. You know, you, you can't do the four hours of sleep, you know, 18 right. hour day, but really when you look back over your life, like the really important or the exciting or the, 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 the periods of your life that have the memories that really feel like they like kind of built your life are almost always those periods, you know, and you, you can't do it forever, but there's really something to be said about that, that like teetering right on the edge, working too much, where, you know, you're nervous that you're not going to pull it off. And if it fails, you know, everything goes south. And there's like that razor's edge of stress and and you hate it while you're doing it. But it's it's weird. It's almost like you're depressed afterwards uh, when it's finally over because it's it's like life. It, you're just back to boring old normal life again. The uh, You're always struggling to walk that line between, you know, uh, structure and chaos. Right. And in our in our field, which again, like your career is your livelihood is based off the actions of 18 to 22 year olds. Yeah. Right. (laughs) So like, as, and for, for me, like when I, like when I started to when I am where I am now, the interactions with the youth of today has changed so much. Um, You know, I remember when I, when I played, like if I walked to practice and my coach looked at, excuse me, if my coach looked at me and said, Hey, do a hundred up downs. It was like, here we go. And you just, you started rolling through hundred up downs. Like there right. was no, and things have evolved. Things have changed. I mean, they have literally any answer you want in the world. Like there, yeah, and right. today, like there's no excuses, right? Like what you want out of this world is solely based off of you, your intentions, what it is you want to create for yourself. Like, and I understand people are born into good situations, bad situations, rich, poor, um, uh, good upbringings, bad upbringings. Like I've seen it all with the different demographics we have recruited from, from all the different schools I've been at. Like we've had kids from everywhere that come from every walk of life. And the biggest common theme that you find with the kids that end up having success is they realize usually earlier than their peers is that they are solely responsible for it as they want to go and they want to get to. And there really is no more excuses nowadays because if you want to go be a millionaire, like go be a millionaire. It ain't going to be easy. Mm-hmm. And you probably don't have all the skill set yet, but you might have the one thing that gives you a shot in a discipline that you can go master. And then at some point you have to evolve to either meet the societal needs or demands or um, find your edge in your niche. That's going to get you to separate. You know what I mean? Like, so, you know, I remember, like my, my greatest time was at Eastern Michigan because I had 11 sports, right? So you, it, we didn't do cutty cooker, uh, cookie cutter things. Like I started because I didn't have a formal standardized education. Like I was very self-taught. So a lot of what I saw from people who had been in the profession for a longer time than I, it was like, we'll just do this for that team too. And it was like, but why? Yeah. And they're like, well, it's, this is done right for this. So like, it's right for that. Like, it's okay. Just it's easier this way. And that was something that I had a hard disconnect to. And then as I acquired more knowledge and read more and tried to advance my skill set, um, you start to see where you can take your journey. So obviously as I streamlined into more football things, um, 
or more football specific work, you know, you're allowed to, again, start to really see what's going to separate you from the rest of the football specific areas or knowledge or training or how you go about your business. But, you know, everything with the hard work concepts, like I know how long I can go for six hours. I know when I need to get eight hours talking back to the sleep concepts. Like mm. I know I can go on four hours for about three days, but that fourth day, I know I have to take a step back or else mm. I'm not going to make it. Um, and you start yeah. to learn where you can push yourself, you know, just, um, I, I was going to say, do you want to add yeah. to that? Well, just, you said the self-taught thing. And I think this is kind of a side, uh, a sidetrack, but I think, one of the biggest issues with the way the education system is set up is that you're, you're, you know, and obviously, you know, the, the university system and, and higher education is important. You need experts teaching you things. But what ends up happening is an expert teaches you things and then you're forced to more or less kind of remember the things that they felt was important to the extent that they agree that you understood it the way they they wanted you to understand it. Which is, you know, it's it's hard to think of a better way because how else are you going to mass educate, you know, people? But in in my feeling and, and from all the areas that I've kind of studied or tried to learn, I feel like, bar none, the best way to fully understand something is to self-teach it, which which sucks and is hard. But then when, it re when you really know that you understand it is then that self-taught material, you have to teach it to someone who doesn't know anything about it, you know, like with your, your players. And I feel like that's when you really know what you know and don't know, you know, because it's, it's, it, it's different than re re repeating something the way the professor wants you to repeat it, you know, that because you can memorize a lot of things and not know anything. But to you to be able to explain it to someone who knows nothing about it in a way that they can then understand it you have to have internalized it and it has to be yours. It's not something you've memorized or something you've read. You have to understand it. And I wish there's a way to kind of force that into the education system. But to me, that's the way to really know what you know. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because the hitting it on uh, right on the head with it, with what you just said, like every day, every day you get to be challenged by a population that wants knowledge now they're not truly seeking out knowledge for betterment, but they want to know the reasoning. Mm -hmm. So every day you do get the luxury of being challenged and tested. Um, especially like when you go to intro something new, right? Like say you're going to introduce a snatch for some reason, what is the benefit coach? Why do I need to make sure it's done this way for whatever reasons, for whatever movement you're going to implement. And it does demand you to stay sharp and it does demand you to stay fluent with uh, the interactions of communications with, with those around you or the, the, the clientele you're teaching or the, the athletes you're teaching. And that's one thing that I struggled with when I started early on, because early on, I was like, man, I'm teaching myself all this knowledge, yada, yada, yada. I'm using these big words. I can like make people feel small because I, I'm just smarter than you, but it wasn't applicable and it wasn't true knowledge because I couldn't explain it other than how I learned it. Mm -hmm. And that's like, in our, in my opinion is in our field is it takes, depending on where your exposures are coming from and how much consistent your experiences are. Like, that's the one thing that like is consistently always worked on from my perspective, because communication is the key to everything. So you're constantly trying to refine that ability with your athletes. Um, and it keeps you sharp. You know what I mean? Like, and so much evolves like the reality is like in our field you don't really know if a max effort box jump is really the critical component needed there's a bunch of literature that's going to tell you yay it's a bunch of literature that's going to tell you no and then there's a bunch of stuff in between that like when you read it, it's super murky and you really don't know what way they're leaning but they kind of said that max effort box jumps are really important but then they kind of said they're not so like where human physiology is at like man staying on top of stuff like what i learned back in 2011 like probably about a good 40 to 60 percent of it's not even applicable nowadays like when you get into like uh golgi tendon stretch reflex yeah, uh mm -hmm. muscle tendon units like all that stuff's really like if you're still banking on what you learned back then like you're pretty much wrong nowadays like connective mm -hmm. tissue doesn't just end at a joint like there's no there's no border where it goes muscle, there's this line and then boom, it's tendon or ligament or any of those concepts. Like there's no true division. This stuff permeates and bleeds and there's really no separation of church and state with the body. With and that, that and that's where 
I mean, that's where the, the that's where all the difference lies. You know, the, like the, in real in really in anything, you know, there's a, almost everything. There's like a bell curve, kind of a normal distribution, and most people live in the middle. But where all the all the real stuff is is at the outliers. And so you talk like like tendons and and and, and things like that. Will you take like a what's the difference between a hyper athlete and a non athlete? You know, they have the same number of muscles, they have the same bones, they have the same tendons, they have the same ligaments. But the minor minor differences, like you take someone with an Achilles tendon. And maybe their heel protuberance is one millimeter further back behind uh, the tibia, and that tendon, the Achilles tendon, is able to insert one millimeter. You know, so your fulcrum then, you know, you have the, the tendon in the foot. Your fulcrum then, where you get to push down on the calf, is you know farther out. You take a crowbar and you extend the crowbar out. Well, a millimeter seems like nothing, but when you it might only the average person might have three millimeters, and then the next person has four millimeters. You're talking a twenty five percent increase in their the the output of the same muscular strength of the calf, and the, yeah. so it's like those little things where where the the edge cases where it, where it bleeds out slightly different than the, the the middle of the road is really where it all exists. Yeah, and like that, and like this is where you start pulling me off into tangents. So like you want to talk about like a unique thing in our field that you can dive into that I think is really untapped at our level still because there is, there's only so much time in the day, but like when you start looking at bodies to recruit, like if you measure a torso, like say you got an old lineman you're recruiting, right? You got two guys you're recruiting, both play offensive tackle. Uh, one guy's, they're both 265. We'll keep it simple. Mm -hmm. If you measure their torsos, you're going to be able to understand really quickly which one can get to 315 and be the prototypical offensive tackle mm -hmm. you want yeah. and which one's torso is going to tell you there's no way in hell unless this kid can accumulate everything in his butt and his glutes like yep. in his thighs like and again like you know you go back and then like you study lineology of like well what is the uh is there any uncles on either side of the family what do they look like how much different do they look like from the parents like how far do you want to extend out your ability to recruit a body um, because they look the part, but can they become the part, you know? So like you, you can get into all those things. Like, well, the, the torso everyone... thing, like that, that's one of the, like under the giant, one of the unique things, why he was so heavy. Most people around seven foot tall are built like seven foot tall people, all lanky, you know, legs and arms and, and it, roughly a normal person's torso. He was built almost like a little person, you know, mm -hmm. very short legs. And so that's why he was, appeared so enormous and weighed so much because so much more of his, his percentage of his body was heavy torso weight compared to, you know, you take someone like a Shaq who's even, he's huge, but Shaq at 400 pounds would seem enormous. Where Andre the Giant at a little bit longer, 400 pounds would probably look like stringy, you know, because yeah. his torso or, or, or like you said, offensive lineman, like arm length, you know, you can't teach mm -hmm. that. You got two guys that are 315 and one guy's got a nine foot wingspan. You know, he's got an advantage that you can't teach. You can't coach. You can't. Yeah. yeah. And like, yeah. I was going to ask you something, Greg, too. I am curious, like you're uh, a strength coach's involvement in recruiting or are you part of the, you know, the player personnel uh, group, if you will, to decide like, Hey, we have these 10 kids we're looking at, or how does that shake out for you? Um, I, I, th oh man, it's a loaded question. <laughs> I if I had to guess, I would, I would, I have no idea, but my guess would be that the coaches are like, who cares how strong he is? We'll, we'll make him strong. And then Greg's like, Oh, great. What if I can't, you know, you can't just make everyone strong. <laughs> um, I think, uh, we do a really good job here. We, we can talk and communicate and feedback. Um, the beautiful thing that we do here is we really do recruit off of cultural standards and more or less attitude and character. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that means that their film says they can play at this level or they right. can exceed talent wise like that stuff is is a given. Um, but we do have a great communication line with with that stuff upstairs and um, Biomechanically, are you able to communicate that? Like you're talking about torso. Yeah, we can we can it? talk levers and stuff with our yeah. guys. Um, you know, and then you always get that random kid that like uh it's another loaded area. You get the kid that like his mechanics are unique to his structure, right? Yeah. So um another great guy in the profession who I've never met, but um I I'm gonna bass I'm gonna chop this quote up because it's not gonna be verbatim. But uh, I think it was Buddy Moore said something about how 
you know, you got this guy comes in, runs a four, three, well, his elbow's not at 90 because that's the dogmatic thing of, of running mechanics, right? Like elbows at 90. Well, now he's running a four, five. He looks like he runs good, but he's slower. Mm -hmm. So like, right. again, understanding again, going back to like tendon ligament attachment sites and, and, and bone structure length, like, you know, cause we got guys that like, they go, I'm like, man, I trained my biceps all winter breaks. The only thing I did, and they look the same. And it's like, well, you are not given the foundation to have great biceps, but you know what you can do is you can pass pro on a freaking elite level D end and you right. can stonewall them. Right. Which would you rather have the biceps or the ability to make a couple million dollars in the league? Yeah. You know? So like, um, man, they're just, they're, they're, this conversation is, is kind of where my passion in the field lies because to me, this whole thing is a, it's a dynamic system. It's always evolving. Um, but more so it's a chess game. And the thing that I love about it, the challenge I love about it, the fight, the struggle, like you never move the piece first. You're mm -hmm. always on defense or you're figuring out if you have to attack or on the offensive side of things, like, because you go to take a job somewhere and say, you don't have a past relationship. You take a job with, with a staff you have no idea. Right. And you find out that offensively they want to run warp tempo. And it's the only thing they want to do is run warp tempo. doesn't matter if they go three and out seven series in a row, but man, on that a series, they it's just a walk-in touchdown because they brutalized the defensive players are playing from the other team. And then your defense is like a big bend, but don't break. So they're on the field forever. Mm -hmm. So now you, you, okay, that's where we're starting. So then you look at your conference, all right? What's our average play? What's our average rest? get the conference like main themes, the averages out. Now start looking at what you know of these guys from previous places and how they're operating their systems. And now you get to that. If you're a cookie cutter approach, you're literally going to put your clientele, your, your biggest financial um, resource in the worst spot. If you train them the same way, mm -hmm. because you're talking two completely different energy systems, just off the bat of what the coordinators want to operate in regards to a system. So like, <clears throat> so you have to adjust that. I would imagine. Are you, are you kind of, you have different for offense defense based on the scheme that their coaches want? Yeah. I mean, like when you start getting into the nitty gritty of where I think our profession can ultimately go, uh, go, it's, it's not a, uh, it's not personal training. Yeah. Cause it's not, you, you, you can never one-on-one -on -one 128 guys in a day, like unless they're going to give you 20 staff members. But when you start looking at, at breaking, like, you know, like for example, at times, depending on where we're at in the year, like obviously we do a, uh, a general concept usually in the winter, bringing them back. You know, if we went late into the postseason with a bowl game, like when we went to the cheese at bowl, we got out of the, uh, the year late, we brought them back a little bit more, less barbell loaded, a little bit less axial loaded, trying to take care of their joints, let everything kind of calm down. Cause it's a quicker turnover into the next year. Um, but like when you start getting into the, usually after our May break is when we start getting one last big general, like aerobic capacity structure in, and then we start trimming it down. Um, for example, like, you know, you take old linemen and start putting them on loaded prowlers, get them used to moving heavy bodies. Um, you can play with the same concepts with your D linemen, but then at some point, you know, we'll start running um, our arch work with the D linemen, getting them used to bending. So the foot and ankle structures and slammed in preseason all that type of stuff, you know what I mean? So like you take your customization or the needs that they need for what they're going to be um, thrown into in camp, working backwards and trying to regress appropriately and then starting to accumulate capacity to handle what's coming their way. So you're talking about program design. I mean, I'm just interested when you're talking about the times, is that something you layer into like different types of like intervals or rest periods? Are you kind of trying to simulate sometimes in part of the program about the speed of play in your conference? Is that something that you try to parallel or? It's something we definitely look at because um, like, for example, in the big 12, like Texas Tech's like, I think this year they might want to average the 99 plays a game offensively. So, Got it. you know, you find out when you're playing them on the calendar year, you start looking at, um, you know, lactic residuals and trying to work back. When can you fit this in to make sure you're safeguarding them, um, working with the defensive staff, like, Hey, can we get a lactic based 
indie drill in today or a team work in today that's more lactic based? Can you move them like this and, you know, talk and communicate about guidance so you can achieve more of a true sports specific concept with still handling the responsibilities of defensive structure. Um, and then if they can't handle that um, for some reason, because maybe the game plan is a little bit more extensive then like that's where we take it on the back end. And maybe we, uh, the rogue echo bikes, you know, get our lactic touch that way to again, safeguard them going into it. Um, so that the first exposure, God forbid, is the first series. And they're like, right. uh oh, you know what I mean? Because you want to sustain the confidence. You want to sustain their ability to handle the stressors coming their way so they can do what they're training to do and what their goal is right now, which is to perform on the football field. And I'm curious, Justin, for you, because it was like, what, 20 years ago, maybe a little more than that, when you played, like, does that, any of that? Oh, uh, I mean, I played at a tiny school. There was, it was is there any thought into the program <laughs> no no well there was by me and there was a yeah. lot of pushback by you know by the coaches that thought i didn't know what i was doing because i was trying to do things that you know we would do i we weren't even doing cleans when i when i got there i had to like try to you know that we would do like uh you know like powerlifting squat bench deadlift and it would i'm like we're doing you know nothing explosive nothing and now uh, by the time i left we were finally doing cleans but they would i mean it was 25 years ago i mean it was th just a different world you know i mean 25 years ago the good the big schools were obviously way, way beyond that you know but um and i because i remember i had a program from u of m but even the u of m program was uh like oddly similar to a bodybuilding program it was right. really it was not what i was expecting they would do body part days you know and very little back work i remember a lot of leg work, uh, which, which, you know, you would expect, but very little hamstring work. I remember almost no hip hinging work. Uh, I don't remember any deadlifts, any stiff leg, any, anything with a hip hinge. Uh, I remember back day was four sets of pull downs or I mean, not maybe not back day, but the only day we did anything with back, that's all it was for back. And I remember just thinking like, wow, this is incredible. This is like, the, you know, this is cause this was, I probably got that in 90. 96 or 97 michigan won the championship in 97 so this was a national championship program basically uh but i it, but for us it was i mean i had to fight tooth and nail i would get yelled at for training during the season and i would try to explain to them like i'm not training hard enough to break anything down but i'm going to hold strength all season yes there's a chance that maybe game one i'm only 98 percent, where everyone else is 100 percent because they're rested and didn't do any weight work during the week but by game you know by the 12th game of the season i'm still 98 percent where they're 100 percent is only 70 percent they've lost all their strength and i think it's improved quite a bit but you know for a really small school 25 years ago there was nothing i have a question I mean, too I, I, uh, I with the uh three and i remember like the first well uh, like i have a question because obviously there's there's uh, a program that that's the best but then it's a program also that the, the the players have to follow so how much do you how many concessions do you make on well if i tell them to do this i'm not going to get the effort needed to get everything out of it so i have you know what i mean do um, you adjust things down meaning that i know they'll at least do this we we're, we're very fortunate we got really good kids but um our approach with communicating like why we're doing what we're doing um you know when we do hard things at times when it's necessary and we do things, you know, for the mental side of things of being able to push through and prove to yourself that you're capable of doing something very hard. Um, but at the same time, like we, you know, a lot of our training has been structured and guided so that the kids can see what the effects of following the program yield for them. So, you know, you get through usually an invasive winter spring ball, is a little bit more managed uh, from the totality of field work because it's spring ball. So like they're not they're not banging as much. They're not as much contact collision. So your training will take a slight step back because at that point the focus becomes football, right? So we kind of take the back seat. Um, but a lot of times, at least in my experience, is like we'll use spring ball if there's anything that we have gotten updates on in regards to research or literature that's proven to be really beneficial. You usually use spring ball as like your micro dosing of seeing like how does it respond with the contact collision now? Um, because you don't want to really ever go into anything crazy new in season because you don't know what the totality is going to be on the back end. You don't know how they're going to handle that new stressor. Um, and you're always trying to mitigate 
um, soreness and invasive nature things, DOMS, all those concepts. So, um, but we spend a lot of time looking at residuals, you know, so we'll work through, we'll usually set a training max by the end of summer. Um, we'll use that to guide in season. We don't, like, I, I would be lying if I told you we came in on a workout and we, everyone worked at, you know, three by one at 90% on the day because maybe the uh, starting D lineman got three more rolls in practice than everybody else. So when they came in, we told them automatically to take 10% off their training number for the day. So they're maybe now they're working at 80, two, five or 85% for an example. So we try to customize what we're seeing out of the data with the GPS and those kind of concepts to try to provide um, the highest minimal dose needed to sustain. And then like during bye week generally, now it depends where the bye week lies, but generally we get, we've been very fortunate to find our bye week and then we'll retouch our residuals so that that can hold then without having to be so invasive. And, you know, again, you go back through and look at what do you need to sustain? Um, you know, one of the unique concepts we got into was doing um, holds and stands. So we might uh, prep a guy on, you know, squat, box squat, bench, floor press, one of those movements and prep them up to maybe like an 87.5. And then from there, just go into a hold on a upper body movement where they'll take the bar out, they'll break at the elbows, and they'll do like a max ISO, usually seven seconds in duration. Or they'll do a squat stand where they'll break at the knee to try to get a neural touch because your body doesn't know if you're on free weights, machine, pneumatic, whatever. But that's been a really good safeguard for their bodies to sustain the ability to handle the load when we are pulling back on the dynamic nature of movement. So then when they get the weight back in their hands or on their backs, it has, in our experience over the last three years, it's really mitigated any kind of invasive nature to when we go back into full. Now we still do full range movements, supplementary in between, or we we'll still use the main lifts. We'll just kick the intensities down and we'll let that shorter range of motion be our maximal intent for the day. But then like, if we were doing that with like our squat stands, like we might pair that back up then with like a uh, ISO split squat with the back knee off the ground at an inch and hold that for duration. Uh, we might scissor that and ask them to try to pull through to increase what's happening in the hip structure. Um, you know, if we're doing a lineman, we might wave squat them because they're already doing so much isometrics throughout the totality of the day. And then our skill guys or our runners, we might have them actually do the ISOs more or less because they're doing so much more dynamic. And then our intermediates, depending on what's going on for them or what position it is, it might be different or they might go to one side or they might go to the other. Um, you know, that goes back to the art form of like seeing how practice goes, feeling out your players and then trying to pair up what is going to yield them the best outcome for the next right. uh, exposure or for the next game, whatever's coming first. Okay, what about so nutrition? Uh, is there much emphasis or thought put into nutrition? Yeah, I mean we've got a, we've got a great staff here. Um, the the uh, the person who heads that up there is very interactive with our guys. Um, you know, we do a lot of communication with them on the front end. Um, so we generally train post practice. We take more of a high-low approach, if you will, especially in season. So if we're having a high practice on Wednesday, we usually try to get our lift done, especially at least our lower body emphasis done on Wednesday if we can um, to try to match up those stressors. And then we can pull back or do more regenerative tissue work on Thursday. Um, but we'll talk to them and like, hey, Wednesday, it's a high day. It's a hot day. Heavy, re heavy uh, refuel coming off of practice. They get that, they go into the locker room, they get their lifting gear, they change their shoes, they put their stuff down, they come back in. At that point, everyone's had 10 to 15 minutes to refuel either with a fast carb or some Gatorade or, you know, again, with the population we're working with, Rice Krispie Treats are a huge fan favorite. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'd just like getting to, something in. I'd like to see something like like field rations with a high molecular weight carbohydrate, something that like, because then that's something you could, you could shuttle in. Like you said, fast carbs, that's fast carbs, but also like slow carbs. So it would, you know, sustain the energy during, during the workout also. And then there's really no risk of stomach distension or bloating. You know, you have like a, mm -hmm. like a, like, 
like Gatorade. Well, Gatorade's interesting because the original formula, you know, it's called Gatorade because it's made by the Florida Gators uh, uh, sports science division in the 60s. The original Gatorade was like about half the amount of carbohydrates it is because they, they did some studies to find out how many carbohydrates they could, how much glucose you could ingest over a period of time without spiking insulin because, you, you know, insulin's a central nervous system depressed and a mild diuretic and all the things you don't want, you know, during mm -hmm. sports events. Right. Uh, so Gatorade now has changed in that it's you know, almost twice as many carbohydrates because when they marketed it to the public, they wanted it to taste good. You know, watered down doesn't taste good. And then they've also changed the glucose, the dextrose, uh, which is just like de dextro or right-handed glucose. But they, they changed the glucose to like fructose or high fructose corn syrup. And so you get like, you know, like the core is still there, but there's there's like the G2 is better because the G2 actually went back to the, the original carbohydrate amount roughly. But then they add some artificial sweeteners in to make it taste better. I'm always like, you know, something I'd like to do long term with with uh, first attachment is find a way to market the field rations because that's really, I mean, it's great for bodybuilding intro workout, but it's really more ideal for like a football game, a, fo a football uh, approach, or long distance running. Because you got the essential amino acids, you have the same electrolytes that are in Gatorade, you know, and even more, a little more. Uh, because another thing with Gatorade, one of the other things they did is reduce the sodium content a little bit when they released it to the public, because obviously sodium doesn't taste that good. So right. really, you want a little bit more sodium, which is what we have also. And I think like, you know, it'd be hard because there's so many restrictions and regulations and that getting the education out would be really difficult. But it's really ideal because you have the high molecular weight carbohydrates so that the, the Gatorade will sit in your stomach. You know, you can feel it. You chug mm -hmm. Gatorade and go run. You'll, you'll feel it sloshing around. High molecular yeah. weight carbohydrate won't. It'll go right through the stomach, through the, you know, into the small intestine. And it'll sit there where it can't slash around, and that's actually where the nutrient absorption occurs. But that's just me talking yeah, about mean, that stuff. But. No, but like in my experience working with you, I mean, the uh, the field rations have been phenomenal, and I'm not paid by you guys or sponsored by you guys. This is my own uh, opinion and knowledge of it, but um, this is something that I got in big with you when we started. Um, and again, it's 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 a different avenue, but it's the same conversation as like what you'll find with the current strength conditioning field is the rules and regulations of the NCAA, who you're working with the, again, remember this from a book, take a standardized test. Did you remember the information we yeah, taught yeah. you, which may not be wrong, but it may not be right, but currently yeah. it is what's accepted. Yes. And then, Again, like the whole, like I remember, no, oh, I've been here seven years. I remember five years ago, and I'm not going to remember the exact science behind it, but I remember when I first learned about pineapple as a post workout and pineapple being like the, the, you'll be able to explain it better than I can, but I remember the concept of the carbohydrate, what it was, and it had to be real pineapple. You couldn't use like canned pineapple or stuff in water. But the pineapple's response to post-workout, post-training, and what that did for the body structure compared to, like, a Gatorade, compared to, like, a fruit chew. Um, and I remember printing those those things out and giving it to our nutrition staff at the time, which was different back then. But, like, everyone was like, wow, where did you find this? And I'm like, um, I got it from here. Um, this is what there is more current in the field. And, like, that was, like, a huge thing. But then we started getting pineapple in for our guys. And then that became, like, the kids loved it because it was new. You know what I mean? Because that's the other thing too. Like you always got to play the game. Like whatever is going to be truly optimal or perfect for the kid because of the 18 to 22 year olds that they are. It's always like I can eat the same thing yeah, six yeah. minutes a day Pliancy. for yeah. months. My wife hates it because I can eat the same thing and she can't handle that. So these kids are the same way. Like you're lucky if you can put like in my experience, like if you got uh, uh, breakfast at the dining hall, if there's eggs out there three days in a row, you are playing with fire. Because <laughs> the kids are going to look at me like eggs again. Oh, oh we're going to, you're going to put out eggs again. And it's like, man. So now you're trying to figure out how you can fluff these eggs up. Like, you know, they put ranch uh, seasoning in it the one day, or they put, you know, uh, chive and, and cheddar one day. And it's like, you know what I mean? Like, again, the process of understanding and the advancement of knowledge in the field. But, you know, I think the, the good thing I think coming down the road is, is again, has the information is so highly accessible and has people start to get into positions to make changes. 
And it's not even an outside the box thinking anymore. It's trying to make the box better. Yeah. And there are people that are very good intended and have the knowledge, but you're generally always so outnumbered. Mm-hmm. Because- well, I think a lot of when we were growing up, a lot of the earlier studies was like maybe military related. It wasn't really mm-hmm. athletics. Like I, I listened to and read some of his art research, uh, Dr. Uh, Andy Gaplin, like he's, he's got a uh, Galpin. I mean, um, he's got like the Galpin equation for hydration and just some, mm-hmm. some general rules that like you would have never heard of, but he's working with professional athletes and, you know, those elite of the elite to like really measure and test, like, what do they need to optimize your performance and you know although they're genetic freaks and super skilled it's just still like okay but how could you make that person still one or two or three percent better or whatever the case is you know so yeah like our kids like i remember the, the biggest thing that uh uh again i'm gonna get the numbers wrong right now but it was if you're dehydrated like something like three percent your power values yeah. or your ability to display power drops like by 40 percent or something like that and that's not accurate it's something like that though Um, Yeah. Well, and the other weird thing is it's, it's kind of, cause there's the, there's not everyone has the same overlap, but there's the overlap when you feel thirsty and there's, you you really have to be conscious because most people will start getting the net, like the, the downside effects, the reduction in strength output before the, like the, the triggers for thirst happen. So if you're not on top of it and consciously thinking about it and wait until you're actually thirsty, you, you probably already missed the boat and are, you know, are not performing as well as you could. Yeah. And like, you know, like, our, like uh, a couple of years back, we went, uh, well, actually, when I was at Buffalo, we, our second game of the season, we played FAU and it was like 99 degrees out with like 97% humidity. And it's like, you're running around trying to grab 18 to 22 year olds attention and be like, Hey, I know like that top 10 song playlist you're listening to right now is super captivating but i've watched you out here screwing around in the hot sun getting your mind right and you haven't drank anything the last 15 minutes and it's like you're gonna look at me and say we didn't train hard enough when you're cramping because cramping is completely and solely based on the fact that we didn't train hard enough and then it's going to be me and you having a discussion about things like drink your stuff take this get in out of the sun get in out of the heat like do the right thing. Like you've been out here long enough. Like, and it goes back to, again, like the educational process and like the constant communication with these guys is never ending, but the ones that are truly invested, the ones that want to separate, man, like they're outstanding. Yeah. You know, well, I know, I know we're uh, coming up on time. So I did want to cover a few things with you. If we could, um, uh, we'll go into another section in a minute, but I did want to just maybe high level two to three bullet points on, I know there's some, uh, really good articles out there that you've contributed to and podcasts that you've talked about, you know, concussion protocol or, you know, head neck trap training. If you could bullet point it. And again, I know we're, we're, we're getting close on time here, but just kind of bullet point, maybe a few key things you've learned that you implement into a program. What, what would they be? Um, I wouldn't have the scientific literature to back this, but in my experience, what I have found is almost the better you can sustain isometric contraction through the best range of motion you have, obviously not pushing through pain or um, an apparent joint issue, um, apparent joint issue, but like, and this is, this is, I'm stealing this, everything I've talked to you guys, I've stolen, I've just probably reiterated my own words, but like a lot of the things that have changed my, my way of thinking with these things are, are, are from, um, FRS. Um, and again, I don't believe in a one, there's, there's not one way to do anything. I think everything's very multivariate, very dynamic, but, um, through the knowledge acquired from getting into that area of training and then seeing how it coexists with contact collision sports, I think range of motion and control and isometric contractions in that area. And then obviously supplementing if you're, if you're fortunate enough to be able to afford neck machines, not everybody can. So I tend to lean more towards what you can do without the money. Um, I'm not saying neck machines aren't great. Um, but if you don't understand like truly how the, the cervical spine works and you're blasting your kids on a neck machine, like I've heard stories of guys breaking necks on neck machines. So like 
just because it's a machine doesn't mean it's it's easy peasy. You can just get in there and go. You know what I mean? Like, right. where's their seat height? Where's that load sitting? If if it's if it's loaded through the forehead or if it's going to customize or onto the you know top half of the face, like, is it one of those ones that's just got the rollers? You know what I mean? Like, what's the band tension doing? You know what I mean? Like, you start getting into like the details of like like neck flexion. Um, and I am going to be rusty here, but if I remember correctly, when you start to initiate neck flexion, I believe the C2, C3 actually go into extension first. So like when you ask people like, man, inflection, like what actually happens to the cervical spine? Like everything doesn't just flex right away. Like your spine is a dynamic mm -hmm. thing. And, and what's even worse is everyone thinks flexion is just this, or, uh, you know, rotation is just this, like there's no pure rotation through the cervical spine. You have to have flexion extension or else the, uh, facets, and as you go down further on the spine, the facets collide in rotation. So like if you're doing like truly vertical rotation core work, your your lumbar facets are literally slamming mm -hmm. into each other, which is going to mess you up down the road. Like you have to flex extend first to clear the facets and then get into your rotation through your spine. Um, and you can take those concepts, not exactly T for T, but you can take those concepts through the whole structure of the spine. And, um, you know, the spine's an area that a lot of people are afraid to train because, well, I don't have any low backs. So I'm just not going to train this at all. Well, if you don't train your hamstrings, are you ever going to truly get the benefit of, of what you're trying to achieve out of lower body? Probably not. You know what I mean? So um, there's just, again, the, the ability to acquire or the ability to push yourself to gain and acquire knowledge um, is something that I, I, I strive for. Um, I'm probably a little bit over the top. I'm that guy from Instagram that's looking at my wife as I order more books to make our, our house look like a library. And she's looking at me like, you didn't even read the last 35 books you bought, but you're buying more. Like, you know, that's something that I've, I've turned into a passion of mine, but again, it's, it's no different than listening to Justin talk about thermodynamics and nutrition. Like, man, like I, I find it so fascinating to be able to read, you know, sociology and see it in play in my environment every day, or, you know, um, mechanics, thermogen, uh, sure all those things can be carried over when you take a step back and you realize that like nothing's really in its own bucket. You know what right. I mean? Like if you get, a, if you get a rehab, right? Like energy expenditures is not infinite. It's finite. So if we have a kid in return to play process and he's coming back from maybe a hamstring, right? So the, the trainers have a protocol for this. And then at some point they say he is good to go back to play and it's, right back to where he left off it's probably not going to work out well because there needs to be a mitigation there needs to be a return to the return to play you know what i mean because like right. did you run the kid through the whole time of the rehab process you, you probably didn't because you're working on the specific concepts of what athletic trainers do to try to supplement and get through wherever the limitation was and then get back to full use of that tissue right so um yeah, it's 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 big. No, it's good. Here. We appreciate that. Well, as we wind down here, we want to uh, just walk through a couple uh, more uh, kind of rapid fire questions. So this we call as we're closing out the uh, the episode tonight. We call this kind of shoot, move, communicate. So some will be one word answers, some will be short answer. So you know we'll we'll challenge you a little bit uh, as we as we as we wrap. But uh, first question is a little bit. It might be a little bit of a layup for you, but in uh, you know if you could. Uh, uh, short answer form here what accomplishment has made you uh, most proud as a coach having a kid because training my kid is just as hard as training these guys but the correlations like through the roof yeah cool. keep it really simple and to the point and move slow good deal and uh i guess this might be this a similar answer but if you could think about it what accomplishment like outside of you know strength coaching uh, are you most proud of uh, meeting my wife because uh, she is the structure to my chaos. And I'm pretty sure I would be maybe in like, I don't know, Thailand or something right now because I wouldn't have stayed here. <laughs> uh, I think we both can echo that. So a lot of fun. Uh, one word to describe your strength program philosophy, if you had to pick it. <sighs> Multivariant. Okay. Dynamic. Nice. Good deal. All right. One word, if you had to encourage, you were obviously a young up and coming coach, moved up the ranks. Um, what would be one word of encouragement to a young up and coming strength coach? What would it be? Don't stop your feet. Right, cool. 
This is really challenging to give one word. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. It's a one word or phrase. That's fine. Uh, the, you know, the, the internet, uh, uh, auditors can, can hit you up in the comments about using more than one word. Uh, all right. So your ideal athlete, if you had a one word or phrase, what would it be? Attitude and effort shouldn't have to coach that. Got it. Coach everything good, else. Good deal. We're almost, almost done. If you had to skip one, we asked everybody this. If you had to miss one, a meal, a night of sleep, or a training session for yourself, what would it be? A meal. Don't yell at me, Justin. <laughs> I was going to say, you don't get much food, do you, right now? <laughs> you know, but you know what? Like, the way this process has gone, like, I, I still feel stuff. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold that for as long as I can. Uh, good deal. <laughs> good deal. All right. Last thing is, you know, at First Attachment, we talk about being all in and uh, that our products, like many of us, are battle-tested. And so the question is, um, you know, what is a – a current or recent battle that you're fighting and uh, kind of pushing through? Who? Um, man, uh, my wife is a strength coach as well. Oh, um, awesome. um, so uh, we're both on average 14 hours from home. Um, family is always tough this far away, especially as you bring new life into, into this world, which is already uh, a shit show to keep it simple. Sure. Um, so I think uh, as we get older and as we continue to have more spawn, um, trying to find that that ability to let your family know that you still think about them when they're so far away. And like yeah. knowing that as you get older, you guys know this, like when you're a kid, it, it's so taken for granted the ability to see your parents, the ability to see your, your brothers or sisters or aunts or uncles. Right. And then you hit that age. Like for me, it was like 24. My I got a call. My uncle died. And I was like, and I was only three hours from home, but I was three hours from home. I was working as a GA, like I was recruiting, um, you know, so I think that like that is really hard as we get older is, is finding that ability to, to walk the line of, of sustaining family and keeping them super hard uh, involved and interacted with our life. Cause my mind, my mind, I mean, my mother's getting older. Like she can't just get on a flight. Like, Right. Uh, my wife's family is the same way. So like trying to find that time to, to bridge those gaps, man, that's, that's really hard. Yeah. It's hard and you don't really, you don't really understand it until you have kids of your own, but right. there's, there's one thing that I, 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 uh, someone gave as a commencement speech and it was like a one sentence commencement speech. And, uh, he basically said that on our deathbeds, we're all going to have the same thought. I wish I would have spent more time with my family, which is obvious. However, to be a complete human, you have to have you know, you have to have a life outside of the family. You have to have goals and things to, you know, and part of being a father is showing your children, you know, that, that you're working hard and striving and trying to achieve things. So that's that, like, for me as a father, that's just the hardest thing is understanding that like everything I do outside of the family, when this is all over, all I'm going to wish is I would have spent more time with my family, but you can't, just sit with your family 24 hours a day because you don't grow as a person. Your family doesn't grow as a family, and, you know, and then even more like concretely, you're not able to provide for them. It's, it's tough. It's hard. It's, I think that's the hardest thing is, is combining those two. I think that's what was scary for me when we had, when we had our, our first child was uh, I remember having panic attacks of like, man, I got to read this or I got to learn this. Like, what if he asked me a question in 15 years and like, I don't know it or like, you know what I mean? Like you, like you start getting these, these things in your head with it. Because again, like, like you said, like you have to live a dynamic life in order to provide a dynamic existence. And um, man, we could also sit here and talk about those special moments, those, those unique experiences we've all had that have made us who we are. So it's like, make the sacrifices, try to make more sacrifices when they're younger is my motto so they won't remember as much but then mm -hmm. like when you're there for the impactful moments and times and ages like right. seize those and hopefully make sure you're setting yourself up for success for that but yeah like you you have to grind and you have to especially in this world now like yeah you know there's no there's no easy paths right the easy path is just being good with your average home and a picket fence and your dog that doesn't shut up when the mailman <laughs> comes and you know, saving up for the whole year to go to, you know, Darien Lake three hours away and yeah. spending a weekend there. Like, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think, you know, you can, you, you realize when you talk to certain people that they're, they have these grand goals and these grand objectives and like, 
I may never get to Mars, but like I'm damn sure gonna end up somewhere in in, in outer space. Yeah, and you know all, I mean? and all like, the all the real important things are in the process, anyways. You know, any in any very very difficult achievement, the the least exciting part or the least satisfying part of the entire journey is is when you complete it is the finish you know you do any major thing you hate the work to get to the end and all you're thinking about is that end result but when that end result happens it's 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 great but it's that's really the 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 least of the whole process it's really like the all that effort building up to it you just don't realize it at the time or maybe you do realize it but it it, i mean it's it's just time after time it's it's the same thing it's that it's the journey that's 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 really the, the gist of it. That's the whole, the bulk of it. When it's all said and done, and you look back. That's what you remember. Yeah. Well, Greg, we want to thank you again for coming on tonight. Um, you know, a ton of information. We definitely got to have you back, but, and we can even get more deeper and granular in the in the training philosophies and things. But for the audience out there, um, you know, be sure to like, subscribe, and follow us. Definitely put those questions in the comment section. Uh, we'll be we'll be happy to answer those questions or we can reach out to Greg on your behalf and get some more answers if you're you know if you're an athlete up and comer or current and uh, or a strength coach and you'd like to learn more um, we're definitely passionate about creating useful educational content everybody so thanks again to my co-host Justin Harris and uh, Greg for joining us tonight and uh, you guys have a good night we'll see you appreciate it <laughs>